pleasure of having a colleague from the other end of the campus from biological and environmental engineering. Jillian Wolfart is a, an assistant professor, has been here only one year, but uh, she seems to know how to find all in all from all the way up there. Um, she uh, did her uh, uh, PhD uh, at Boston, no, no. At Brown. Brown, Brown. That's right. One of the one of the hockey rivals, and then she went to work at Boston University, which is another hockey rival. But luckily, she wasn't a hockey fan, so that's okay. And her her talk, as you can see, is not going to be trash talk on hockey, but rather why she loves trash and uh, what she can do with it if you're uh, creative. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be talking to you today, especially the students. Um, I hope I can kind of inspire you to think a little outside of the box and think about ways we might increase our sustainable uh, kind of metrics around the world and decrease our footprints. So I called this Why I Love Your Trash, an integrated biorefinery transforming biomass to biofuels. And it's my understanding that you haven't done a lot this semester on uh, maybe thermochemical biomass to biofuel conversion. So I thought I would spend a little bit of time setting the stage for you as to what I'm talking about in general, and then go over a little bit about the research that we do in our lab specifically. So I thought I would start out with the problem. Um, biomass to biofuels, what went wrong? Corn is the most widely produced crop um, in the US. It provides food for humans, it provides food for animals, and now it's an energy crop. Okay. You can see this is the total US corn production and the amount of corn that's been used for ethanol since about 1986, 1987. And does anyone know what happened here? It happened around 2003 to 2007. What do you see when you go to the gas station now? 10% ethanol. Well, when that happened, the amount of corn we grow and the amount of corn used for ethanol production increased dramatically. Why? Because the government mandated that we use a um, blend in at up to 10% minimum. So that's why you see 10% minimum ethanol at the, gas, at the gas station. And really, it was meant to be a way to spur on buy renewable fuels, help with emission offsets. That sounds great. 10% of your fuel that we use in this country is now biomass based. It's renewable, it's sustainable. However, what happened, of course, is that not only did the production of corn increase, the amount used to produce ethanol increased, the price per bushel increased. So now it costs a lot more to grow corn and then to buy corn because there's more demand for it. So in a pictorial form, the demand for corn ethanol increases. Corn farmers go, yay, I get more money for my corn. Maybe I'm not subsidized as heavily. The land to grow corn becomes more valuable, right? Okay. Because the land to grow corn, to sell corn is more valuable, a lot of farmers switch their food crops, their corn food crop, to energy corn crops, okay? What does that mean? Well. The ethanol process doesn't care what the corn tastes like, right? It cares about the amount of biomass you can grow, meaning fertilizer use increase because we just want to grow more and more of it. So eutrophication increases because of all the runoff, because of all the extra fertilizer. And now we need to take that land that we're using for corn and offset it because we still have to grow food and so we need land in other areas, so we deforest. That's a huge problem right now in Brazil. Instead of growing soybean in the US, we deforest Brazil and we grow soybean there. So now we hasten climate change in that way. And of course, if corn is more expensive, it's not only the popcorn at the movie theater that you're seeing a 25 cent rise in, which I think most of us won't notice, it's that feed prices for animals increase. So your beef dairy prices also increase which means people who are already marginal for food security are now hungry. They're not just food insecure, they're now hungry because food prices have increased, so hunger has increased. Okay. So this is kind of a net negative. 
Do I think that this is all bad? Do I think we ruined the earth and our country by having 10% of our gas based on corn ethanol? No, it was a start. And I think most people will agree that changing the public's mind is, is difficult, right? You're not just gonna say to them, hey, go put this garbage in your car, it'll run just fine. No, it got people to have a conscience that biofuels could be successful. However, we can't keep doing this. Corn ethanol was a first generation biomass to biofuel conversion, okay? It was produced directly from a food crop. We took land for food, we grew corn instead. Where are we now? We're at second generation, so we're looking at non-food crops, things like agricultural waste, forest waste, municipal solid waste, um, plants that grow on marginal lands that you can't cultivate food on, as well as third generation, so things like growing algae. We're not quite at fourth generation yet. So that's where we are. My group focuses on second generation fuels. How do we take waste and make it into a fuel? How do we take something that is going to otherwise go to a landfill and make it into a fuel? So a local perspective on this problem. Here's what currently happen, happens right here in Ithaca in Tompkins County. You take your recycle bin and you can put into it your aluminum cans, your paper products, your glass, some plastic, uh, and all goes in there, and it goes off to be recycled, we think. Food scraps maybe become compost, but of course that requires that you collect them and either compost in your backyard or you take them to one of the town sites, which I don't know about you, but I'm too lazy to go down from Lansing all the way downtown to a drop-off site, so basically my food scraps go in the trash. And trash things like paper cups and plastic bags styrofoam, that all goes to a landfill. What are the problems with this, right? Well, the food scraps going to compost, yeah, it's great for your garden, but that's really minimal value, and it decomposes and releases methane. So we're releasing a greenhouse gas to not put these things in a landfill and put them in our soil. So it's a minimal value product. And then, of course, trash, throwing something away, is really expensive. It decomposes to methane. It emits fossil fuels while you're carting it. So not, so not so good, okay? This is the current state. But imagine, if you will, that none of this goes to landfill. Okay? The recyclables like the metal and the glass still become new material, we hope. The things that are made of carbon, the plastics, the paper, they can go and become new material if that's economically viable or they can be part of our carbonaceous residue. Right? The fossil fuel you burn right now is just carbon from the past, right? It's just sat underground for a really long time under pressure and it's transformed into a really nice dense carbon. This is just not dense carbon, but we can make it that way. So I would argue that anything that's carbon based could be a feedstock for us, okay? And that's our goal. Now, there's a pretty big spectrum here of what we could do with this, all right? If you start talking about an integrated biorefinery, we can talk of a thousand different products. We can talk about things that are super high value, like the biopharmaceuticals, right? Things that are um, biomass sourced, uh, maybe algae, maybe uh, plastics, whatever you want to get them from, all the way down to biocosmetics, <laughs> then feedstocks for bio-based polymers, then a little less valuable is maybe your plastic bottle. Everyone loves the Dasani bottles now, right, that are plant-based plastics. Um, then going down a little bit less valuable, but we can make a lot of it, are things like a biochar, which could be a soil amendment or used as an activated carbon. Activated carbon is what's in your Brita filter. Um, right now, Brita is making them from coconut shell waste, so it is a biomass-based. We can burn it and get heat or generate electricity. We can make synthesis gases, um, and finally we can make things like liquid fuel. I don't know about you, but I remember the early to mid 2000s when gas was 450 a gallon. It doesn't seem like fuel and transportation fuel should be at the bottom end of this, right? That it's super cheap, but but it is, and this is where the problem happens. Okay. The problem is that Americans really love to drive cars and fly on planes, and we don't like paying for it, okay? I don't know about you. 
I go to the gas station, I'm like, gas went up five cents. Oh my God, my day is ruined. I never would know the difference. And if I wasn't such a miser, you know, I probably wouldn't care. Why you, we focus on that as being a metric in our society of the economy, I don't know, but we do. People are not willing to pay much more for gas, even if it's renewable, than they are paying right now. They just don't want it. So our goal in all of this is to figure out how we can make this side cheaper to make and sell it at the same price as what we do for, for conventional materials. Okay? Otherwise, people are not going to buy into this. To get to all these different products, we have a whole suite of methods we can use. In biomass conversion pathways, there are two basic ideas. We can have thermochemical, so heat and chemical conversion. We can have biochemical conversion. So thermochemical biomass molecules are broken down by heat and or pressure. In biochemical, we have things broken down by bacteria or enzymes. So we use biochemical processes all the time in Ithaca alone. The wastewater treatment plant is a biochemical process, right? Um, things we're talking like anaerobic, aerobic digestion, hydrolysis, fermentation is an example, right? Corn ethanol is fermentation. These are slow. Okay, they're slower than thermochemical processes. 30 days minimum, right, to have this happen for a lot of these processes. But they don't require a lot of energy input, so they're fairly cheap to run, okay? On the other side, your thermochemical processes, so combustion, gasification, pyrolysis, hydrothermal, these are really fast, okay? We can do these on the order of minutes for some of them. They can happen continuously or in batch, and they can produce a range of products. However, they require an energy input. So that's what we have to figure out is how do we balance the energy input required to make it reasonable to produce energy on the outset? Okay. So today I'll tell you about the work that we do on pyrolysis, which is a system with no air. Okay, it's an inert system. The basic concept is a burning match. So if you strike a match, you have that initial sulfur, sulfur flare, then you start seeing a flame like this, right? This zone here is the pyrolysis zone. What's happening in the wood match is that all the little lignocellulosic components that make up the wood are getting hot and they're starting to devolatilize. De they're starting to break apart and kind of evaporate out. There's no oxygen in that zone, so it's pyrolysis. Okay. It's like hot gas. Things like methane, alkanes, CO, H2. Then, as it starts becoming exposed to air, we start burning the gases, so we're oxidizing them. There's soot particles that are coming out from the wood at the same time. That's why you see the, the hotter bright orange flame. And then we start seeing our combustion products, so say, our CO going to CO2, and then we have an air diffusion of the plume, which is the part that usually starts wiggling, right? And then what's left, the black part at the bottom, is the char. Right? And interestingly, if you ever don't do this at home, light a match <laughs> and let it burn for a few seconds, then put it down on, say, a Pyrex watch glass, you'll see the char, and you'll also see a tar come out of it you'll see a liquid that pools under the match head and forms. So we have three phases that come out of this. We have a gas phase, part of which <coughs> is combustible or oxidizable. We have the tarry liquid phase that comes out, which unfortunately splits into both an aqueous and a bio-oil phase. And we have the solid biochar. This is the match at a bigger scale. So think about a pile of wood chips. If we start heating them without any oxygen present, usually at temperatures above about 400 degrees, that whole process that's happening in the match is what happens here. So first, at lower temperatures, all the water comes out of the biomass. Then the unstable polymers degrade. So if, if you think of cellulose being a, a polymer, right, all different glucose monomers, they start breaking apart. Then the more stable components start decomposing, release gas, 
And if we go to really high temperature, uh, we start condensing that, that carbon structure, and that's when we start getting coal. Okay, so a biocoal is just a biomass that's been heated to a high temperature, and it starts carbonizing. So that's kind of a little bit more scaled up process. And then if we want to go, say, pilot scale, pseudo-industrial at this point, what do we have to do? We take our biomass, we make it smaller because heat and mass transfer limitations are a problem. We might have to pre-dry it, we might have to make it smaller. We then pyrolyze it, we get out those condensables in the bio oil, and we then have to deal with them. And we get our biochar, our solid biochar out. Okay. This is where our group focuses. Okay. Why? Because this is where the bottleneck is right now. A lot of these fuel <coughs> synthesis steps are well known from petroleum engineering. We're not going to go reinventing the wheel. The problem is getting from that bio oil to something that resembles a crude fuel is difficult. Okay. Here's what we know about pyrolysis. If we do it at low temperature, like four to 500, and long residence time, so we're doing this slowly, we get a lot of that char. It's not super high value char, but we get a lot of it. We increase the temperature a bit and we hold it for less time, we maximize the liquid yield. If we do it at high temp and long residence time, we have a lot of decomposition and we maximize the gas phase. We heat it really fast, like a fluidized bed, um, and moderate temperature, again, we maximize the liquid. And the smaller our particle size, the more we tend to allow that devolatilization process. We allow those molecules to escape the biomass and turn into liquid and gases. It sounds great, right? If we can do this, why aren't we doing it right now? Okay. Well, not to be the Debbie Downer on a Thursday afternoon, but there are a few problems. Okay. The first is the bio oil itself. When we say bio oil, everyone gets excited. They're like, ooh, I can power my car. You do not want to put this in your car, at least not right now. Okay. Why? Because bio oil from pyrolysis is water miscible. It's highly oxygenated. It's this nasty smelling black liquid. Um, it doesn't mix very well with a lot of hydrocarbons that are in gasoline, has a fairly low heating value, not, not very pourable, it's pretty viscous, pretty acidic. And of course, over time, it gets even better. The viscosity increases because volatiles are coming out of it and it starts phase, uh, phase separating, forms deposits. You don't want to put this in your car right now. We can't even pipe this right now. It will corrode all the lines, right? So, so we need to work on that. The dirty details, why is it like this? Well, here's an example of a bio oil we made from avocado pits. Uh, we like guacamole in the lab. And you can see there's a pretty wide product distribution in this uh, gas chromatogram, right? If we assume that, roughly speaking, every peak is a different compound, we have things like oxygenated acidic components. We have good stuff. 5-hydroxymethylferferol is what uh, NREL and Department of Energy want us to use as a platform chemical. So if we could maximize that, it would be good. We have things like fluorine, fluoranthine, pyrene, polycyclic aromatics, those big tarry rings, um, plasticizers like dibutyl phthalate, and we have thermosets. And of course, if you get those two things together, you basically form plastic in your line. So congratulations, you've now killed that. But okay, maybe, maybe the story gets better. Well, the pyrolysis gas right now, it's, it's getting there. Um, this is a this company I found, BioGreen Energy. They're, they're trying to sell pyrolysis gas as received syngas. Syngas is mostly methanol, CO, H2. It's, it's very combustible, it's a good fuel. Pyrolysis gas is not that yet. Um, this company is trying to sell received syngas because it's the non-condensable fraction. The problem, of course, is that pyrolysis gas has quite a bit of water in it. It also has a bit of CO2. That's not so combustible, or nitrogen. So, so we, have to, we have to boost this. And if we want to think about things like hydrogen being a fuel of the future, we got to boost that. Um, Probably want to get that heating value up. You know, we're getting there. The good news is, is we know how to fix this to at least get some hydrogen and some methane and make it a better fuel. 
Then of course there's the biochar. If I want to sell biochar, I need to be able to produce it, right, in, in something that makes sense, something that's valuable. The problem, of course, is that depending on the biomass I use or the processing conditions, it can have vastly different properties. Everything from different surface areas and porosities, particle sizes, mechanical strength. It can have totally different pHs and cation exchange capacity. And if I want to then use it as a soil amendment, I might not be able to do that. You know, plants don't like it. Um, totally different bio properties. So there's not a lot of um, kind of ways to produce this from, from heterogeneous feedstocks that make a consistent good product. So we have three products and we have three problems. Here's where we are right now with the limits of known science. Okay? Most of the bio oil and pyrolysis gas studies that look at upgrading are done on model compounds. Now, I showed you a gas chromatogram that had like 150 components in it, and most of the research is done on like two of those at one time. That's really not representative of what's going to happen industrially. Most upgrading is also done downstream. So there's nothing ahead of the process to try and get a better product distribution, which is really expensive, right? You guys have all seen the petroleum diagrams with all the catalytic cracking and distillations and all that. That's all really energy intensive. Um, and then of course, most upgrading is done with pre-made, um, fairly expensive catalysts. What do we need? We need processes that can work on heterogeneous feedstocks, that are flexible, that can respond to seasonal and regional availabilities, and can maybe change the product dynamics depending on the needs that we have. So, it's kind of the background. Let's, let's go over a little bit of our approach. Now, I don't know about you. When I was a kid, I liked to go into the kitchen, drive my mother bonkers, take down my big mixing bowl, start dumping things into it, mixing it up, maybe putting it into the oven if everyone was lucky at that point, and seeing what would happen. Okay. And as I got better, I learned that maybe you should use a recipe and then get creative off of that. But I used to call it kitchen sink chemistry. And the reason I loved it was it was just a chance to be like, what happens when I put something together? And I'm, I'm sorry to say that I haven't been able to let that go. Okay. But now we, now we call it transdisciplinary engineering. Okay. So let's think about a general pyrolysis pathway from the fuel science, chemical engineering side of things, right? We take our biomass, we pyrolyze it, we get a really crude bio oil. We then downstream upgrade it with catalysts. Often they're like meadow nanomaterials or zeolites, things like that. Lo and behold, we have an upgraded bio oil and it costs more than, you know, to make it than we can sell it for. All right, fuel science. Separate literature entirely. From material science, we take biomass, we impregnate it, we soak it with a transition metal or noble metal, whatever you want to do. And we get all these little metal particles swimming throughout our biomass. And then we calcine it, or we oxidize it, we heat it in air, burn away the biomass template, and end up with bio-templated nanomaterials that kind of take on the shape of the biomass we're using um, because biomass can be a structure directing agent itself. And then those bio-templated nanomaterials can be used as part of the downstream upgrading. Yeah. Enter in transdisciplinary approaches. I said to myself one day, why in the world am I making nanomaterials using the same kind of process that I would use to make a bio-oil? Hmm. So we said to ourselves, what happens if I do the same idea as a material scientist might do and impregnate my biomass with a metal? Then, instead of skipping straight to oxidizing something, I pyrolyze it first. I then end up with a funky biochar metal combination. Oh, that's a heterogeneous carbon-supported catalyst. If I, if I oxidize or calcine it, I can get a biotemplated nanomaterial. But our hypothesis was that in doing this, basically forming the catalyst with the biomass in situ, would we end up with upgraded bio oil? So that was our hypothesis here, was that forming the catalyst could lead to upgraded bio oil. So what did we do as a first check? We impregnated cellulose and corn husk. So cellulose is a, like a model just to see what was gonna happen. 
and then corn husk as a really heterogeneous feedstock that was abundant at the time. Then we pyrolyze it. So we, this is a small sample. We're not making like industrial scale fuel here. Okay, we put it in a, a fixed bed pyrolyzer, heat it up, see what happens. We can measure the gases online. We can collect the bio <laughs> oil in a cold trap. What's happening? Well, our hypothesis was correct in that we are able to enhance the gas yields and actually change some of the compounds that we're making by incorporating the metals into the biomass ahead of time. So you can see this is partial pressure of, uh, I think we have a hydrogen and then probably a methane or ethane um, as a function of reaction time. When we have the silver incorporated biomass, we see a lot more hydrogen, about 200% more for cellulose, coming out faster and at lower temperatures from the biomass than we do when we don't have the metal. And same thing happens with a lot of other gases. So catalysts that are known to upgrade gases or to upgrade and crack these, these pyrolysis gases after they're released also work in C2. They, during the process, process, they can enhance the gas yields that we're looking for. Did it work with our bio oil? It did. So here's just an example of the cellulose one, very similar results for the corn stover. You can see that the red is the silver impregnated one, the black is the, um, the non-impregnated one. And basically, if you're gonna make a good biofuel, you want compounds that in a gas chromatograph are separated early. They're the lightweight ones, they're the alkanes, they're the ones you can burn happily. We don't want things down here so much. These are our tars, our heavy molecular, high molecular weight heavy compounds that are just really gunky and difficult to deal with. So you can see we really were able to boost those lighter weight ones that we want and kind of set, uh, diminish the formation or crack those, those secondary ones, especially things like our 5-hydroxymethyl uh, furfural, we really like that, our furfural. Um, some of the phenols we want to try to decrease, you know, rings with oxygens on them aren't so great in large numbers. Uh, so we see similar catalytic effects happening when we put uh, silver in to the gas and to the fuel. And of course, everyone wants to see pictures of nanomaterials, because yay. Um, so if we pyrolyze our biomass impregnated material and then we calcine it or just literally switch the atmosphere to air, we see the formation of different types of nanomaterials that depend on the biomass we started with. So for the cellulose, which is really pure biomass, we basically end up with pure atomic uh, elemental silver coming out. So 99.5% atomic uh, silver tiny bit of carbon residual left, tiny bit of oxygen left. We get these really fun like nano meshes of silver. I don't know what they could be used for. Someone's been like, oh, you could put that in a wound dressing. Cool, why not? Um, you can also recover it and use it again in the process or the catalyst. With the, the feed corn though, you see we have quite a bit of um, kind of contaminant, shall we say, and oxygen. Why, if we look at an uh, x-ray diffraction of the crystal pattern here, we see that this is AGO, not AG. So we form a different form of the silver depending on the biomass. And we also have residual of, say, sodium, magnesium, some phosphorus that were, that, it's there from the corn growing, right? It's in the, it's in the soil, therefore it's in the corn, so it's in our nano mesh. Uh, so maybe not as useful as an industrial nanomaterial, however, it would still be a pretty good catalyst because magnesium is a pretty good catalyst. Sodium enhances heat transfer, so interesting. Where are we going with this? Well, we want to uh, kind of identify the catalytic mechanisms that are responsible for this biofuel upgrading. It's not possible to identify every single one. Right? We're talking like 400 compounds. You can't do one reaction network um, you know, for every single thing, but we want to look globally what's happening in terms of hydrodeoxygenation, deoxygenation, decarboxylation, um, we're using materials informatics uh, with a collaborator to identify possible materials. So we're working now with transition metals, things that are much cheaper, abundantly available. Mm -hmm. Looking at optimal loading of these materials. So how are they getting into the biomass? Do they have to be in the biomass to do this? Or could they be supported on something directly above? 
Does it have to be in C2? And then we can't predict the product properties just based on composition alone. We're trying to figure out if you use a heterogeneous biomass like a municipal solid waste, what do you have to do to it to make sure we get a consistent product out of it? Okay. So kind of a similar idea, but a different byproduct, still mixing junk together in the kitchen sink, really, is the idea of, of making a biochar for water treatment, okay? Or a soil amendment. We like the water angle. Food, energy, water nexus that way. So if we take the biomass, we pyrolyze it, we get our bio oil, we can upgrade it. We also get that solid biochar. And a lot of people say that the biochar is really great to remove contaminants from water. And it is, it can treat a lot of different contaminants from water, but often it has to be upgraded. It has to be made into an activated carbon. Something else has to be done to it to make it a good water treatment material, kind of like your Brita filter. Well, we kind of were looking for an inexpensive catalyst that could upgrade the biofuels in C2 and that could also maybe upgrade the biochar that we had. So we didn't have to go through a, another step downstream and waste more energy. And we thought about clay minerals because clays have a lot of the same catalytic properties that transition metal catalysts do. They're, they have a lot of the same elements in them. And we wondered, could we put biomass and mix it with clay, about five weight percent, different kinds, we looked at different compositions, crystal structures, pyrolyze it, would we get an upgraded biofuel and would we be able to make some sort of a heterogeneous sorbent, so a biochar and a clay combined, that could remove contaminants from water? Why did we think we could do that? Because clays are often used to absorb things, right? To remove contaminants from things. And we find that it's really biomass dependent in terms of how fast we can improve a reaction. So this is just a simple uh, reaction rate. So a normalized mass loss rate uh, as with a temperature. And these are mango pits, mango <coughs> pits plus fuller's earth or bentonite clay. And then pineapple plant residue and pineapple plant plus fuller's earth. And you can see here that the, the temperature at which this major reaction, the pyrolysis reaction happens, doesn't change that much, but the reaction rate increases significantly when we add the clay. Okay. So, all right, we're, we're speeding up what's happening. We're losing more volatiles faster. That's good. We also find that we can improve the pyrolysis gases with this. So this is, again, hydrogen, just as an example. Um, on cellulose is first a model compound to look at, and we have three different, uh, well, two clays, montmorillonite and kalanite, and then sand is kind of a control. The reason we did sand is if you think about it, sand should be inert, right? It shouldn't have a catalytic effect, at least not chemically. Uh, not like that we would expect the kalanite or montmorillonite, something that has like magnesium and aluminum stuff in it. But in fact, the sand is somewhat catalytic. It helps promote the formation of these gases. Why do we think that? We think it's enhancing heat transfer, right? Just like you would put sand in a fluidized bed reactor to help enhance heat transfer to all the particles, we think something similar is happening there, and we're really increasing um, the gas yield that we can get out of this. In a more diverse heterogeneous system, so this is municipal solid waste, um, the top line is a gas chromatogram showing uh, just municipal solid waste pyrolysis. The next one is with five weight percent montmorillonite and then five weight percent kalanite at the end. And what happened here is kind of a mixed bag. We thought we were getting much better gas results, uh, results with the gas with montmorillonite. So if we wanted to increase things like hydrogen and methane, we definitely wanted to use the montmorillonite. But when we looked at the bio oil, the kalanite was actually giving us more deoxygenation. We were getting fewer oxygenated compounds. We're getting more um, alkanes and alkenes out. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag as to what the catalytic effect is having. And do we want to maximize liquid yield or gas yield? Um, so that's kind of along the idea of we have to design processes and have different materials to maximize different yields with different feedstocks and different times of the year. 
And then the last question we asked was, could we make a better adsorbent? Could we make something that removes contaminants from water by doing this heterogeneous uh, pyrolysis? And we can. So this is low temperature. And this is looking at biochar as, so mango pyrolyzed at 280, super low temperature, 350. And then with the addition of Fuller's Earth and the same thing with the pineapple. Um, and then just bentonite clay at the bottom. And QE is the amount in milligrams that per gram of biochar that the, um, that the biochar can absorb of methylene blue, just as an example. It's kind of a standard baseline in the literature. And you can see that by incorporating the Fuller's Earth into the biomass, especially for the mango uh, waste, we're even enhancing, this is five weight percent, the absorption capacity over the plain bentonite itself without going to high temperature to manufacture it, so we're saving energy um, and making a material that can remove quite a bit of an organic contaminant from water. So where are we right now with this? Well, just looking at two biomasses, we can increase yields of, of kind of syngas type compounds that we want. For our bio oils, depending on the biomass, it's a mixed bag. Um, we're getting good furans and hexenes with um, the mango. But unfortunately, with the pineapple, we actually saw a slight increase in the high molecular weight oxygenated compounds. So maybe we don't want to do that one. Um, increasing surface area and adsorption capacity. Um, and also for the, for the mango pit, I didn't show it, but we're also increasing the rate of adsorption. Uh, so our, our adsorption sites are more accessible. They're, they're kind of happier to be there. So it's kind of two examples of what we're working on now in our lab. And we like to say we're taking a materials-based approach. Right? Instead of just focusing on the fuel, we're looking at how do we change gas yields and how do we change fuel yields, looking at how we're changing the material. What can we do to it ahead of time? Um, we're making things like heterogeneous clay char um, materials, looking at the idea of soil nutrient sequestration, if we could use these as a fertilizer, making things like bio-templated nanomaterials, um, really trying to understand how many different products we can make and products that are high value from this integrated biorefinery so that if maybe we can't produce gas at less than 250 a gallon by using pyrolysis, there are so many other products along the way to offset that amount um, that it still would be economical. So then just to thank funding because, yeah, we like that. I'm happy to take any questions. good question. We look at biomass sources that are concentrated and would be available in a, a small area. So mango was chosen, uh, especially because in India you have huge piles of just discarded mango uh, pit, uh, often available year round and in very concentrated places. Same thing with um, pineapple plant biomass in Hawaii. So um, pineapple plant, uh, if you've ever seen the fields, they basically can grow two to three um, <coughs> kind of generations of pineapple, and then the plant has to be cut down. And this is just acres and acres of biomass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just one, I guess what is the major hurdle between go or to go from your idea of single stream recycling or composting into biorefinery? Scale. So scalability right now is a problem. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been up to the Cornell kiln. We have a pyrolysis kiln here. It's Professor Lehman. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Lehman uh, is kind of in charge of that one. Um, and it, it's pretty big scale. It can handle, I think it's like 100 kilos an hour, depending on the feedstock, you know, the density and all that. Um, but it only goes up to 600 because they're using it more for soil amendment, biochar production as opposed to fuel. Um, but the 600 is a cap right now. Uh, if you want to do a slow kiln, I think I have a picture. Oh, I do. So there's, there's the kiln and a kio next to it. Um, so part of it is industrial scalability and temperature ranges. If you go above 600, you start needing different types of equipment. You know, you can't just use a standard stainless steel problem. Um, and then there are pyrolysis units at pilot scale that are doing fluidized bed, but they have their own problems with char removal systems, um, kind of like 
downstream reactions that you don't want happening. So right now, it's just we don't have enough of the science on what to do at the front end to stop some of that at the back end. And then on the flip side, if we can't stop some of it on the back end, we don't know how to upgrade it to get it to that point where it looks like a crude fuel. So I, I would argue that that's the bottleneck right now, and that's probably why we chose to work on it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the education. Uh, you uh, started, you motivated me to come here because you were talking about trash. I love trash. And now you're talking about pineapples and mangoes. And it doesn't seem like what I put down in the... So that's trash. This is a municipal solid waste mixture. Um, that we actually painstakingly made to mimic the composition of U.S. municipal solid waste. Um, we did it by weighing out like precise po portions of different proteins that mimic the American diet. That's residual papers, fibers, yard trimmings. Um, so, uh, and there's a paper that details that. Um, but yeah, this was actually done with municipal solid waste. So along those lines, as we know. Uh Municipal solid waste has lots of heterogeneity to it. With, it might not just be just these so like chlorine and things like that. So what do you suggest that we have a more enlightened view of how we what we send to the to the landfill or you know Ideally. so, so that it could be more representative? I mean, that seems to me a huge problem. People throw everything yeah. in there, you know, and uh, yeah. they it's, do. It's a big big issue. So you would you could look at that and I assume this is kind of quote clean and yeah. MSW, right. It is. And, yeah. you know, I think Americans, we are individually smart people, but collectively just stupid. <laughs> um, so I, I lived in, in Italy for a couple months in northern Italy, um, and they, <laughs> they have bins. Sounds really dumb, but you're like, okay, there's a bin for glass. Oh my gosh, we had this in like the 90s when we started recycling. There's a bin for metal. Yeah, then there's a bin for plastics that easily get recycled, right? Like, and oh my gosh, that includes styrofoam for them. Then they have plastic films as another thing. So all the bags that you have to take down to Wegmans that everyone forgets and throws out, they have that. Then they have um, a bin for organics and then a bin for trash. The only thing you pay for when you live there is your trash one. The trash bin is probably this big. And I think we filled it twice in the entire time, six months we lived in this town. Because everything can be recycled, right? And imagine if we had a way where, oh my gosh, instead of even having to break things down that much, because right now they're breaking down the, the organics are going to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but imagine if you could put everything, but say glass and metal into one bin and make a biorefinery out of that. We don't then have the chlorine issue. We don't have, for the most part, the heavy metal issue. Not enough that it will matter. You know, we end up having a fairly grindable feedstock. But that requires not only the science, but the, the public and the policy that go along with it. Um, so you said that this, this small town in Italy had this sort of like recycling thing set up. So was this also present in like the cities there? And like, do you think it's something that like would be possible to implement in America? <coughs> yeah. Cities in America? So um, in some ways, it's almost easier in a city because you have more frequent waste collection. Um, so we lived in the small town halfway up a mountain. But at the base of the, the mountain was the city. Um, you know, not nearly as big as New York. Um, but, you know, a US size third tier, second tier city. Um, and people did it. Because otherwise, you paid for your trash. Any bag you put out in that trash bin, you got scanned and you got a bill for. You didn't get billed for anything else. People are cheap. You know, there's an, there's an economic incentive there to give them everything that, that works. Um, so I actually think it would be easier to do in cities. Um, cities also tend to be a little bit more liberal, a little more educated, cosmopolitan, at least in terms of a grassroots movement like that. So. Not everyone's crunchy Ithaca, you know. How did uh, Italy prevent somebody from putting plastics in the glass container? They just didn't. <laughs> yeah, they just, it, it's, there, there are pictures everywhere that show you what goes in everything. And, and people just didn't because it was like, what's the point? They, they were educated enough to the, to the, to the idea that, that their things were being reused, that was helping their environment, it was saving them money. Um, 
So there wasn't the the stigma associated, I so guess, with recycling. There watching them, you know, sort of they did do random checks every now and then. <laughs> That's the way you could do it. Too. Yeah. I, Certainly, some of the separated landfills I've seen, they'll have a wonderful person there that takes enormous pride in making sure you don't do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Can I add that my wife is Norwegian. Whenever I go visit, she is very diligent, and as are everybody right. around, exactly. doing exactly the same thing, except they only have four bins. <gasps> And you have to buy a different bag color for each bin, so you kind of know, like, I think purple was plastics and blue was organics. So it's, the system's just in place. We don't have that. I'm interested in the plastics. You are able to use plastics in your system. And what is the, like, is there toxic byproducts or? So the temperatures we can go to, not as much. They actually just start like cracking and breaking down. Um, it's the same idea. Uh, as when you do plastic, a lot of plastics recycling, and then you feed it back into you know the petroleum byproduct feed line, um, you're just devolatilizing it, just breaking it down. Um, would I want to stick my face in it while the process is happening before it's finished? No, prob probably not. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> like this isn't. We're not making bio oil that you can go take and then use immediately. It's not a food product being produced. Oh gosh, no. Please don't try to do that, anyone. Uh, students, no. Um, but we don't have like the toxic off-gassing you get when you burn it, because we're not oxidizing the plastic. Um, we're more recondensing the polymer materials into different polymers. Um, and that is a bit of a problem right now. I mean, a lot of people don't really understand that, that China not taking our waste isn't like just a political issue, right? They were, they were taking waste. Um, and in, in fact, not taking it may be a good thing for us because it, it might force us to actually come up with processes to break down plastics that are not one, two, and five. Um, those plastics are, are hard to recycle, right? China was burning them for the most part. So it's not like they were doing the environment any favors. They just got money for doing the bad environmental thing, which kudos to them. That's financially smart for them. Um, you know, so. So maybe the hope is that we can develop processes like this that can incorporate uh, ways to, to deal with some of those plastics, um, which is, it would be good. Well, let's say thank you again. And we would like to ask